Welcome fellow freaks, geeks, and nostalgic 90s nerds to my channel, Slime and Slashers. Actually, it's over here, where we talk about everything from Nickelodeon Slime to horror movie slashers, and a lot of stuff in between too. But today, we're doing horror talk, and I'll be showing you some titles I found on my recent vacation. So, I went to some out-of-town bookstores and found some goodies, hee <laughs> hee. So we're gonna talk about those and um, show some of those as well. And also I'll tell you a little bit about the different horror movies that I'll be watching for my summer horror movie slasher marathon. So that'll be a lot of fun. Plus I've got a shark marathon. So a summer slasher marathon and a summer shark marathon. So lots of fun stuff going on. So, I'm excited to reveal these finds because I did find quite a few things at the bookstores that I went to. One was, one of the bookstores was kind of expensive. And I was like, oh my god, these are terrible prices. I mean, it wasn't outrageous, but it wasn't like usual bookstore, used bookstore prices. Like, you know, I found some there that were like seven bucks, eight bucks. I was like, this is, no. I usually pay way less at an actual bookstore. So then I found another bookstore that I bought a lot from, and they had decent prices, but the owner was a little, a little strange. So we'll, uh, look at what I got, but yeah, I'm more happy about, I don't know, because one, the guy who was strange kind of was like talking politics when I was checking out, and I don't like that, but I had already given him the books and the money, like, to start, like, you know, checking out. And then he started with, like, all these weird viewpoints, and I was like, what is going on? I'm here just for books. Like, I just want to buy the books. So, like, that was disappointing, and then the other place is the expensive place that I went to. So, it was like, both had some big flaws, but I found some gems. And this is only half of the books that I found on my trip. I am saving, like, the other half for future, like, edited hauls, because sometimes I like to do my fun little video effects and voices, so I was like, I don't want to show too much and then not be able to use like the f voice effects and things but thanks guys happy sunday if you're watching live if you're watching later on repeat on youtube hi and welcome thank you for watching be sure to hit the like button if you enjoy the video and also be sure to hit that bell so you always get notified when i release videos or go live like i'm live right now Alright, so we've got Jonas Simmons in the chat, and we've got our friend Good Guy Dave in the chat. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to those of you who are watching but not in the chat. Alright, so I'm going to start off with a real good one here. Oh, and let me take my key off. If you want to find me on social media, including Instagram and Twitter, you can find me at SuperKickingIt, spelled this way, S-U-P-E-R-K-I-C-K-I-N-G-I-T, and I'm taking that off so you can see the books better. We don't need no key. Get out of here, key. All right, so I've had a really tough weekend. Like, I'm not feeling good right now, and I've just been, like, very anxious. So this is going to brighten my day, sharing these gems and these books. So I'm trying to pep up, feel better. So hopefully my anxiety does not come across and more of my funness comes across, I hope. But yeah, this is a good way to get me in a better mood, looking at this freaking awesome book here. All right, so this is Blood Master, and it looks cool. It looks decent just from the front, but there's more. There's step back art. So look at this creature, Sea Guy. I know my lighting's not as good as when I do these on my cell phone, so I do apologize for that. But I think we can make do, right guys? From beneath the sea rises a bloodthirsty demon. And I love these Pinnacle books. So this is published by Pinnacle, of course. I like how they have the image on the spine. And a lot of times they have it on the back, too. So that's one good thing about Pinnacle is many of their books do that. So this was a nice find. I was like, yes. I mean, of course, the uh, spine's a little beat up, but that's okay. Then I found a book that I already own, but I knew I didn't have a first printing. And so I bought it because I was like, this is a first printing. All right, so here's the first printing version, and here's the version I already had. You may not notice any visual differences here, but uh, this one has raised text. So this is the first printing. See, it's got embossed text here. And also there's a full number line on the copyright page. So that's how you know it's a first printing. And this one does not. And it doesn't have anything embossed or raised. So yes, I rebought this. 
and I'm very happy about it. I do not regret it one, one bit. It's nice to have, like, a first printing. All right, so here's another. This is a strange cover. It doesn't scream horror, but it just was so unusual I had to pick it up. All right, this one's called Black Magic by Whitley Stryber. And there's just a guy screaming and some, uh, I don't know, some colorful dots. Like, a, it almost looks, like, it's called Black Magic, but it almost looks like a web of if evil or, or really to me it looks like a disco web but hey we'll go with web of evil if that is more menacing because it is supposed to be horror this one was published by pocket and it says a sensuous mind-shattering novel of terror yeah sensuous because there's some weird stuff on the back here like there's all these sexual innuendos here as the world shudders Jamsh- Jamshid? Jamshid hurdles towards the final shivering climax. He grasps you in his wicked loving embrace. A dark, seductive beauty. His ecstasy transports you beyond the moon, beyond the stars. As Earth shudders towards its end, as it throbs with the power of his mind, he is the ultimate weapon, the final terrifying angel of death. No one can hide from him. No one can escape his evil. No man, no woman can resist his black magic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that one's just full of innuendos. Uh, and like, you know, wink winks and <laughs> whatever. Dave is asking me, what do I do when I buy books that I already own? Well, I gotta figure out what I want to do with those. I'm thinking about either I can give them to people, sell them, my- Because I've got a, quite a few duplicates now. There are a few that I wouldn't mind selling to people who are looking for certain titles. Like, like I have a second copy of The Gilgul, which is a pretty, uh, desirable title. So, I could definitely sell that one. It's not in the greatest shape, but, uh, it's still a copy. So, I'd have to see. I'd have to, like, create a store or something. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. But for now, I'm just keeping them off to the side, like, putting them on a bookshelf, but not, like, on display. I have them, like, on a horizontal stack behind a vertical, not a vertical, a regular standing up stack or row of books. I'll put the repeats and the rebuys or the duplicates behind it. All right, and so here are two books by Graham Masterdin, and I was excited because I'm trying to collect a lot of Graham Masterdin because I want to read more and more of his work. I really enjoyed the first book I read by him. It's his book, Walkers. I had a great time reading that one. You know, not the greatest read. I didn't rate it five stars or anything, but I had a good time the whole journey in the story. So it's like I wasn't bored at any point. It could have been a little shorter, but it was still very gruesome, had some gory scenes, very enjoyable. So anyway, I want to keep reading Mastered in and see, you know, which novels of his I like the best. So I found this one, and this is Night Warriors. It's like a large snake on the... I think I'm going to reposition my light real quick. Uh, it's a large, like, sea-looking creature. Dragon. There we go. That's a little better. All right. It's a very dreary day outside because usually I'd have some sunlight coming in here too, but it's a uh, dreary and rainy. It's a perfect Sunday. All right, and now I found a copy of The Manitou, which this is the movie tie-in edition because this is footage from the movie and on the back it's got the cast from the movie which includes Tony Curtis and I actually watched the movie before I even knew that there was a book before I was even into old school horror paperbacks so I watched the movie like two Halloweens ago I believe it is wild it is crazy I'm excited to read the book and compare it with the movie it's still pretty fresh in my mind it's kind of hard to forget the movie um so it's like very in the forefront of my mind. I remember it very well. So we'll have to compare and contrast. I love doing that. So yeah, evil does not die. It waits to be reborn. And if I like get into the plot, it's it's pretty crazy. Basically like this woman, at least the movie, she's got like this growth on her neck, which she thinks is a tumor, but it's like this like Indian spirit coming back for revenge. Anyway, more stuff like that sounds crazy enough, but it, it gets crazier as like, the movie went on. So if the book's anything like that, which I'm pretty sure it's at least semi like that, because you know, that's the base story, uh, I'm going to be very excited when I get to this, whatever that may be. It might be a while. 
Okay. Let's see. There's so many. It's like, which one do I show next? It's always hard to decide. Okay, so I showed in a previous haul that I bought Mark Frost's book, The List of Seven. So I'm not going to show it again. This really could be considered more of like a mystery or fantasy type of book. But there's definitely horror elements when you look on the inside of the cover. I mean, there's a guy with his eyes sewn shut somewhere. Guys with like scars all over his face. So... I already had this one, and I knew that there was a sequel, and it had the number six in it. I couldn't remember the title, but when I was looking at the bookstore, I found it. So, The Six Messiahs, and this one actually has a better spine than this one. So, it's like, this one I'm gonna, like, not even want to read just because the spine's so nice, and I have so few spines that are uncreased and unblemished. So, it's like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to read it now. I mean, I do, but I don't. So Mark Frost was the one of the creators of the show Twin Peaks, so that is one of the things I learned when I picked up the list of seven. I was super excited to learn that because I love Twin Peaks. It's so odd and weird and crazy. So I'm excited to get to the list of seven, and again, this is the sequel book. And there is a step back art. I'm going to have to show some of these again when I'm doing this on my cell phone because this is so dark. Uh, it says, A ch Chilling, Thrilling Tale. First came the seven, now there are six. Like I said, this is the sequel. Let me readjust my light real fast. All right. Hopefully it won't reflect too bad out of my glasses. We'll see. I'm sure it will. <laughs> Whatever. What can you do? All right. <clears throat> That's a little better. I can already tell. Okay. Also in a previous book haul, I showed this book, and I said I wanted to read it. It's called Crawling Dark, and it's by Pauline Dunn. Now, Pauline Dunn is actually two sisters who wrote this together. So, Pauline Dunn is the name that they chose, but it's a sister writing team. Well, this book actually has plagiarism in it from one of Dean Koontz's books called Phantoms. So, I want to read Phantoms because I actually haven't. So, I found this old school copy at the bookstore in Florida, and it was cheap, and I was like, I just want to read it, so I wasn't looking for, like, a fancy copy, I just wanted an old school copy, because I want to read, like, an older copy versus buying a new copy, because you can still buy this, but yeah, I want to compare and contrast these two in the same month, I think that could be quite interesting, and I want to see, I'm sure I'll be able to tell where the plagiarism is, so that should be interesting, seeing how much it truly, like, steals from the book, because literally, I, I believe he sued the sisters. I, I mean, I know that they had, like, this whole newspaper article about it, and it's kind of fascinating. All right, and also in a previous book haul, I showed Blood Child by Andrew Niederman, of course, the author of Pin and a lot of other great books, but I said in that haul that this cover looks a lot like another cover that exists and that would be this cover I found it on my trip. So The Twelfth Child by Raymond Van Over and as you can see it's a baby you know chilling on his mom's shoulder and both the babies have vampire teeth and both the moms have little you know poke holes in their necks. So yeah I already had this one. Why am I always doing it backwards? I always I already had this one but I picked up this one in Florida. So this is kind of cool. I like seeing them side by side. I'm excited. I'm going to display them side by side as well. All right. Let's see. All right. I really like this cover because it's got a tombstone on it, which I dig. No pun intended. <laughs> Cemeteries, you know, digging graves, whatever. Stupid. I didn't even mean to do that. All right. But this one looks cool. Come on. You got to admit it. This is in Silent Sealed. By, and I, last time I had a book haul, I showed more of her books. I can't even, like, begin to pronounce it. Catherine, P-T-A-C-E-K. However that's pronounced, that's the author. But yeah, I love this. I love the colors. Fantastic. Look at the detail there, too. Very enjoyable. That was published by Tor. Now, this one is not even you know, technically classified as horror on the spine. This was published by Pocket. It's called Helix. And I just bought it for the cover alone because of this test tube. I know it's not like the official name. Beaker. And it's got like a skull in it. Like a skull beaker. Yeah. 
Pretty darn awesome, if you ask me. If I could only hold things the right way. Come on, Kelsey, hold things. You can hold things. All right, I also found, so now um, my book club that I have, one of the choices for our July read was, we had a couple of choices. A lot of them were like newer horror books, some indie stuff, and one of the choices was Cujo. So I found an old school copy of Cujo. Spoiler, it did not win for the group read for July for my book club, but I still wanted to own Cujo because I do personally plan on reading it, and it's awesome to have an old school version of it instead of going and buying like a new school version, which wouldn't have as cool of a cover because covers nowadays just are not the same as back in the day. So yeah, it is what it is. We've got Nails joining us in the chat. Hey, Nails, so glad you're here. And yeah, I found Cujo. I'm pretty excited. Dave is uh, excited that I found it in the chat. Yeah, I was super pumped about it. All right, we're going through these faster than I thought. It's because I'm not reading the descriptions like I usually do, except for that crazy black magic, which was basically like a sexual description, like it was like a sex horror novel, it was so weird. Anyway, moving right along, another book published by Tor, we've got Somebody Come and Play. And this is kind of subtle, um, so on the front, we do have a die cut here where we can see a girl staring out of a creepy, like, house castle window but it looks like a circus tent kind of look at those like the tops of the the house it's it reminds me of a circus uh, it's not really like a normal looking house anyway that's near here nor there we open it up and it is a creepy let me try to get the lighting right it is a creepy girl and what's even more creepy is the doll that she has that she's holding in her hand which almost looks like an elf doll like the doll has pointy ears. Anyway, I thought this one was creepy. I should have picked up a few more of these because they did have multiple books by Claire McNally, which is the author of this book. So I could have picked up a few more, but I was trying to limit, like I was really trying to limit how many books I bought because I brought an extra suitcase. This was a whole other thing about going to these out of town bookstores in Florida. I was so nervous about transporting the books back here to New Orleans. So I brought an empty suitcase and it was going to be my carry-on suitcase. So I had planned like it's not going to get checked and like, you know, tossed around to where the books could get da even more damaged or than they already are at the bookstore because I never find perfect copies really. So I, I brought the empty suitcase and as I was buying these, it's like, I'm not going to have enough room in the suitcase. No, but then before I left, I did have uh, room in the suitcase. Luckily, I packed it, put like clothes around it a little bit. And when I got to the airport, I even opened it up, looked at it one more time after I had been rolling it around for like an hour. I wanted to make sure that they weren't damaged, so I repositioned them again, kept it on its side versus like standing up. I kept the suitcase on its side because that's how the books were really the most stable. And so then really it only had to get rolled, you know, upwards, and then we put it into the compartment above, and that was resting, you know, flat like this, which was good because that's when I think the books were the safest. So yeah, none of them really got damaged as far as I can tell in the transporting back and forth, but I was really holding back just because I really didn't want to pay like FedEx any kind of, that, that would've been fine. I've done that before, actually in Florida, coincidentally. I went to horror movie convention. It wasn't just horror movies. It was like a horror convention period. It was called Spooky Empire. I've talked about it before in previous videos and also previous streams. One of the funnest trips of my life in terms of, I bought so much stuff. I spent thousands of dollars, bought so many horror movie posters and horror artwork and oh my gosh, it was so fun. And I got to see a lot of people talk like, the. speaking of Cujo, uh, in the movie Cujo, it stars Dee Wallace, and that's who I got to see, and she talked about filming Cujo and how it was, like, actually really cold, even though it's supposed to be really hot in the movie, but, uh, it was really hard for her, and she had to keep crying and crying, and she's, like, at one point, like, she had trouble producing tears, like, it was really stressful, she said, like, her anxiety was out of the roof for that the whole filming. But she was super nice. Oh my god, I enjoyed hearing her talk. Also, there was a Children of the Corn panel there, and that was amazing. So the two main evil kids, you know, Malachi was there. Um, he wants you to Malachi. Anyway, that was great. They were there. And also, there was a Nightmare Before Christmas panel, and um, yeah, the voice of Jack Skellington was there. Chris, is it Chris Sarandon? I can't remember his last name. Um, but he was there, and so was the voice of Oogie Boogie, and 
it was just awesome to see them there on stage. And I was like, oh, yeah. Because, you know, uh, the voice of Jack Skellington is also Prince, uh, plays Prince Humperdinck in The Princess Bride. So that's kind of neat as well. Nail says she doesn't know if she could watch or read Cujo. Don't know if she'd get too upset. She's a dog lover. My friend Nail's in the chat right now. And um, as far as the movie goes, I actually think the movie's pretty subdued. And you really, you really root against Cujo, even though he, like, you know, he's a dog. Uh, and, like, dogs, you know, we all love dogs. But you still root against him because he's really, like, really mean. And he's trying to get to the family. And so you're kind of like, oh, get away, Cujo. Get out of here. But, yeah, I don't know. It might, it might upset you, Nails. I don't know. It might be safer not to watch it. <coughs> it doesn't upset me too much. Just because, you know, he's a rabid dog and there's nothing they could do like to save him they just have to try to get away from him because they're trying to kill them like Cujo's trying to kill them so what else can they do I won't say it how, how it ends though all right moving right along so anyway to complete the story really quick I had to ship like hundreds of not hundreds it was like a hundred like movie posters and other memorabilia and merchandise stuff that I bought from this convention and it cost a lot to ship it I found a FedEx store like and this was in Orlando I was only in Orlando for this trip for like one day but but yeah it uh, cost a lot of money so I didn't want to do that this time so I was trying to hold back but I still managed to get like a ton of books like I've got 20 more that I'm not even going to show today so I'm probably showing about 20 25 so that's like 50 books that I had no problem transporting back in my little suitcase, so that worked out, I guess. But I was nervous. I will say, I, like, I, like I, I, when I got home, the first thing I did was open the books. I was like, "Is the books? Are the books okay?" And they were. Okay, so here is one that I've seen Leon, the paperback maniac from the Paperback Mania YouTube channel, talk about and show a lot of books. He he has a lot of books. So does Cameron Chaney. They have a ton of books. Uh, and I, I always am surprised, uh, to, not surprised. I mean, I, I expect to see that they have books that I find out in the wild when I'm rewatching or watching old videos of theirs and their book hauls. I'm like, oh, I just found that. Or, oh, I have that one. So I like seeing the ones that I have that they already have. But Cameron told me that recently on my last haul, I showed a book that he didn't have and it blew my mind. I was like, what? He didn't have a book that I found? That was crazy. Because he's like the master of like vintage horror paperbacks, him and Leon Booth. But really, Cameron is like, he's got a pristine collection. His collection's amazing. I was just rewatching some of his uh, hauls the other day for his, or not his hauls, his vintage horror bookshelf tour the other day because I was like, maybe if I like watch this before I go to bookstores, I will like find some of these titles, like, you know, make it happen. Manifest it essentially. And I, I kind of did find a few, I think I found at least one I saw in one of his videos. So anyway, this is on Wings of Evil. And I, like I said, Leon, paperback mania has uh has shown this before now there is a little damage um right over here but that doesn't bother me too much still in decent shape this one's published by leisure and it's by richard lewis newman and on the back we could see i don't know why they just cropped off part of the skull here but this is the bottom half of that skull and the wings but i'm it's cool when the back has something too instead of just text Irish Moxie is joining us right now. Hi, Irish Moxie. And they actually just came from watching one of Cameron's YouTube videos, and yet we're here we are talking about Cameron. That's so funny. How coincidental. We're so glad you're here, Irish Moxie. Thank you so much. And yes, he did just release a video, which I just watched as well, like an hour or two ago. Uh, very good stuff. He did like a reading wrap up where he read 14 books and that's like a lot of books, but he had some really good picks on there. And Dave is singing in the chat that he actually added some of Cameron's books from his wrap up to his want to read list on Goodreads. That's cool. All right. We've got Mark Warall joining us in the chat. Hi, Mark. Welcome. Welcome. We're showing some vintage horror paperbacks. Now, unfortunately, we're already getting close to the end of my paperbacks, and then we're going to talk about horror movies a little bit, but uh, you can always go back and watch the beginning of the video once I'm done live streaming, because I showed a few already. This one I was very pleased to find. This is one of the books that have been reprinted by Valancourt Books, and it's one of the paperbacks from hell, like, line, the new line of books that they resurrected. So, this is Black Ambrosia by Elizabeth 
Engstrom. And the thing is, though, this one's an old school copy. So, yeah, I could get a new school copy with, it would have the Paperbacks from Hell logo on, you know, the book cover. This one does not because it's old school, old school vintage. I found it in the wild. I love uh, finding stuff. Like, when you see it, you're like, oh, it's like a holy grail moment. It's awesome. Not just this title in particular. I'm talking about, like, any, like, cool-looking cover. You're like, oh, oh. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. And it's very exciting, too. And it makes you in a cheerful mood. Because I gotta say, to reiterate again, just this chat is helping so much. So thank you guys for watching. Because, yes, I've been in a very stressed mood this whole weekend. And a really down mood, I gotta be honest. So this is lifting me up already. Thank you so much, guys. It means the world to me that you watch my videos and take the time to do so. I can't even tell you how much it means. And it's brightening my day right now, for sure because I've been so down and I, I don't want to talk about why but I have been very down so let's take one more look at it pretty damn cool and once again for those of you just joining I'm apologizing for the lighting it's not as good as my usual cell phone camera here I'm so sorry mystic mac is also in the chat with us right now and yes, it is the same author who wrote When Darkness Loves Us. And Mystic Mac is referring to Elizabeth here. I believe it is the same author. And I think that's one of the other titles that... I think they released two of her books in the Valancourt books line of uh, books from Paperbacks from Hell. Now this one's cool. It's more of a mystery. I mean, it even says mystery on the spine here. But the cool thing is I just had to have it. I mean the cover. So this is like one of Alfred Hitchcock's books. There's tons of these books with Alfred Hitchcock on the cover. And I love the title as well. It's not just like the cover art. It is the actual title. Alfred Hitchcock's happiness is a warm corpse. And he's like popping out of a coffin here. He's like, yo, I'm here. <laughs> I don't know. I just like it. I just like it a lot. And these dudes, these skeleton guys, these reapers are like, let's... Let's carry this mofo. I don't know where we're going, but we're carrying him. I just love this. It's it's wonderful. Let's look at it one more time. Oh, let's look at his face here. He's very happy to be in a coffin. <laughs> Who knew? Also, it's cool because these old Alfred Hitchcock books have the blue pages, the dyed pages. Love that. Love it. Love it. Love it. You gotta have a vintage horror dance anytime you do a horror haul. And in fact, the other day when I was like falling asleep in my mind, I had this awesome riff of, and I didn't mean for this to happen. So now like my best ideas come when I'm like falling asleep or like driving around or just thinking and daydreaming because I daydream a lot. So I was like head in my head and sinks no strings attached. And all of a sudden I got lyrics that I could change like, in my head to be about horror books, like, in a vintage horror book haul. So I'm gonna reveal that little spoof on NSYNC's No Strings Attached on my next, like, edited book haul. Not today, because I, I want to edit it and do something stupid and uh, fun, like, maybe, like, a dance. No strings attached. Bam, bam, bam. There's the 90s flair. So, so what the channel brings is horror, but also 90s and 80s nostalgia. So, even though we're concentrating on horror today, we have to throw some 90s in with my buds and sync. And sync is my jam. Always will be my jam. Never embarrassed to admit it. And sync was my favorite band growing up as a little kid. And uh, I still listen to them quite a bit, actually. But the only difference is now I actually also listen to Backstreet a lot more than I did when I was a kid because I had, like, loyalties to NSYNC as a kid. And I was always like, no, get out of here, Backstreet. So, so anyway, yeah, look out for the next vintage horror book haul because I will do a little spoof of No Strings Attached, which, by the way, is the name of one of NSYNC's albums, but it's also the name of one of the songs on the album. But a lot of people don't know that song it wasn't like the hit single from that album or anything if you uh guys remember it's gonna be me uh or bye 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 those are from that album no strings attached but i actually my favorite nsync song is no strings attached it's kind of like it, it flies under the radar so i don't know Rob is asking me something that is intriguing me and piquing my interest in the chat here he's saying did you hear about the back sync idea 
Is it like members from Backstreet joining and like singing with members of NSYNC? What is this, Rob? Spill the beans. Spill the 90s beans right now, please. And, and Nails also says NSYNC came on in the car when they were out doing chores and instant happiness. <laughs> it really is. It makes you uh, just smirk and smile. And yes, everyone's like uh, laughing about Kelsey Karaoke. That's when I sing along to songs really bad. Which is really just my my singing style is bad. So that's any time I sing. The Kelsey karaoke isn't specifically bad. It's just all bad whenever I sing. All right, actually, this is the one I actually saw Cameron show in one of his previous bookshelf tours. I'm sure I've got way more that he also showed, but uh, his copy is much nicer because he just finds, like, w amazing copies. This one's got some, like, paint or white on it. I don't know what it is. It's almost like another book stuck to it or something. Love this one, though. Look at this menacing vampire here. This is The Changing, and that's by F.W. Armstrong. Let's take a little further away look here. Nothing much on the back. This is published by Tor. There's only text on the back. But I like the font style. I like how it kind of, like, dips around the moon. I like that. I don't know, and the, the G at the end is, like, super big. It's like, we're gonna make the G really, like, big and tall to, like, wrap around. I don't know. Design elements kind of fascinate and intrigue me, and I really kind of like to look at them. I'm really into fonts and stuff. Like, sometimes when I'm making, like, little graphics for my videos, I spend forever looking at different fonts, and I'm like, damn it, like, there's too many fonts to choose from. Like, it's, you can't even go through them all, but I would like to, but there's just not enough time. All right, we're actually nearing the end of, like, the ones I'm showing today. I wish I could just show you all of them today, but I really, like I said, I want to edit it and make it nice. Here are two books by J.N. Williamson, and traditionally, books by J.N. Williamson have great covers, and so I get really excited when I find some of his books, because I always find that he has some really nice cover art on his books. So this is The Banished, and again, J.N. Williamson, and I, I like it. It really feels very old school. The colors are kind of subdued. Here are some creepy kids with, like, white eyes. They're like, come on, bitch. <laughs> We're gonna get you. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think they're saying, come on, bitch. But, but you get the picture. <laughs> they were rejected by their families, cast aside by society, and now banished from the face of the earth. I like that. One group at a time, they vanished, engulfed, swallowed, absorbed by a great white ball of light. What was the mystical force that took them away, and why? What did those poor misfits have in common? Psych Psychological... I can't read. Psychologist Stacy Bennett and writer Jed are compelled to find the answers to the questions, not realizing that they, too, are part of an arcane plan. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting. By the way, this is published by Playboy. And you can see it's a cult here. Playboy occult. I love when they classify what the book is on the spine. I like that. And here is another title by J.N. Williamson. This is The Longest Night. As you can see, it's like the semi-naked lady, but the cool part is in the mirror where it looks like she's got a skull face. And I also really like the purple... I guess it's lines, but it looks like a curtain to me. I just, I find that element very nice. Like, it kind of makes it look theatrical. Even though, I think it's just lines, but it, it comes off, yeah, it is just lines, but it comes off like curtains to me. I, I don't know why. But as you can see, it's reflecting my light. Whoa! Yeah, so it's reflective, obviously. Again, I really like, I really like his, uh, his covers. For the most part. There's a couple that are duds. But here's the back. So again, it's kind of like cropped part of the front. I like that. The ladies of the evening will never see the dawn. I like that. Alright, and is this the last one? Ooh, we're we're the, at the last vintage horror paperback I'm going to show. But, please guys, don't go away because we are going to talk a little bit about horror movies. So if you like horror in general, please stick around and we'll talk about some movies. It's mostly movies I haven't seen, but uh, I'm excited to talk about them nonetheless. Nonetheless. <laughs> Doesn't have a T on the end. <laughs> nonetheless. I'm so brain dead. I had like two hours of sleep last night. All right, so this is a Fear Street collection. Like, it's a special edition. It's a bind up of two super chillers. Fear Street Super uh, Super 
chillers. This is Goodnight Kiss. As you could see at the bottom, it says co Collector's Edition. And the cool part is, when you open it up, there is a step back! Nice, huh? Vampire with bloody teeth. I like it! Alright, so this binds together Goodnight Kiss and then Goodnight Kiss 2, as well as a new vampire story. At this time, it was new, back when this was, you know, released. Uh, the Vampire Club. So, and of course, that all of it's by R.L. Stein. Very excited about this. It was just laying there at the bookstore, randomly, uh, you know, stuck there. I was like, oh, I will save you and bring you to my nice home instead of this dusty old bookstore with this, where this old man's talking crazy politics while I'm trying to check out books. So I saved the books from the fate of having to listen to the guy spout on about all kinds of crazy politics, whatevs. All right, guys, so that was my vintage horror books, and hopefully this stack doesn't fall while I'm talking about movies and stuff. Stay, stay. I want these books to be safe. Mystic Mac in the chat is asking, how many vintage horror paperbacks do I think I own? Well, I actually started to catalog them on Google Sheets. Google Sheets is just like Excel, but it's online. That's a good thing. So technically, if I was in doubt of if I owned any of these already, I could have pulled up my Google Sheets on my phone at the bookstore and double checked to see if I, you know, if I had something in question, I could double check to see if I had it. Because as of right now, I have almost everything cataloged except what I just showed you and uh, a few that I have back there from Florida as well that I'm going to show next time. But yeah, I basically think that spreadsheet says I own two, I think like 230, 240. And I just started collecting like a couple of months ago. So I'm kind of pleased with the amount I've amassed in a short amount of time. And I haven't like, you know, broke the bank or anything. I'm not in debt or anything. Uh, I've got a good amount of savings and I've been like, you know, not using my savings, but I'm like, oh, I could buy this. I can treat myself today. I can treat myself today. And I'm making good money at my new job. So I'm like, yeah, treat yourself, as I said. So yeah, uh, I have with this though, I think I added at least another 50. So I'm saying I'm creeping along to 300 now. And that's not even counting. So I only categorized and have cataloged all of my paperbacks from hell type of old school vintage horror titles. I also have started to collect thanks to Cameron Chaney, but it's a good way. <laughs> I said it like almost as if it's a negative, but he is feeding my addictions, I gotta say. But I love him, so it's not in a negative way. Um, it is, uh, I'm getting inspired by him to collect vintage YA and vintage like children's horror too. So I have been doing that and that's cataloged separately and I haven't really caught up with that. So not counting like all my goosebumps and all, which of course wouldn't be paperbacks from hell, but it would be horror and vintage horror. I have, pay, uh, I've got Christopher Pike books. I have point horror books. I have fear street books now. So who knows with all of that, if you count all that vintage horror, how much do I have with that now too? At least like another hundred or 150, I would say. So, and that's like kind of the new stuff that I have that I also did a binge buy recently of summer horror, which was more new horror because I wanted to support some like smaller named authors and indie authors and just like newer authors um, of horror. So I just did a whole big thing. I might, I don't know if I'm going to do another book haul because I already have like three other book hauls to film. I have so many books like piling up to do hauls for, but people seem to like them. So I'm sure nobody will mind, I guess. Like if you guys would like that, leave it in the comments below. And if you've read any of the ones I showed today, also leave that in the comments below. If you're watching live, you could leave it in the chat. If you've read any of these titles or if you have a collection and you have any of these in your actual collection, that'd be cool. So yeah, I reckon I own about 300 Paperbacks from Hell as of right now. Now, not all of them were featured in the book, but I still consider all of them Paperbacks from Hell because they're vintage horror, you know. Nail says, uh, they bring me a lot of joy, and so treat yourself for sure. Horror Gardeners in the chat, hey, welcome, and says, yes, more book hauls. Everyone loves the book hauls, and it keeps me buying, so it's ridiculous. <coughs> Pardon me. Low sleep. It's not good. All right, let's talk movies. My other love. I do love books, especially now. I'm a newer reader, though, I will say, but I've read a lot in a short amount of time, so I'm pretty proud about that. I've, I've been trying to read diversely, like, you know, mixing new horror with old horror, and I think I've been doing that recently, especially in the last three months since I've discovered Paperbacks from Hell, really, three or four months. So I've amassed a collection and have read a lot in that time. I'm super, super impressed because I didn't think I could read as much as I've been reading lately, but... 
my first love really is movies because I grew up just loving movies of all kinds, not just horror movies. I'm just a big movie buff because my dad is a big film buff. He would like, you know, watch movies with me. We'd hang out in his room. Some of them, my mom would come in too, but mostly it was me and my dad watching film. Uh, a lot of stuff was 90s. He bought me a lot of VHSs too throughout the years. I have a massive old school VHS collection. So yeah, I'm just into movies and I actually went to, I guess you could call it, film school. I didn't graduate with a film degree. I actually switched my major because I realized I didn't want to make film. If it was a true film school, it really wasn't a school. It was a film program at this university called the University of New Orleans, which does have a great film program, but it's more for making films or like if you want to be a director or do something, you know, actually like in production of films. Whereas I wouldn't have minded going the route of film criticism perhaps and like writing about film or even teaching about film and the analysis of film and um there's a thing called mese in scene which means like within the frame and so you can analyze a lot of stuff like that is shown within a frame of a movie or within the you know square that you see on your screen there's a lot of sometimes like you know analogies and I don't know, a lot of cool things you could, like, really analyze if you took the time. I had the greatest class I ever took in college was American Film as a Literary Art. And it was actually an English class, so it wasn't, like, a film class, it was an English class. So we read books, but we also watched movies, and when we would watch movies, we would, we'd, uh take notes and a lot of people would like analyze like crazy stuff like stuff that I would never have thought of I even did like a group presentation with other people on uh, American Beauty and that one was fascinating uh, just talking about you know their the wife in the movie her desire for perfection so there's lots of like you know her pruning her roses and her scolding him for almost spilling drink on the couch like just really shows you how perfection means a lot to her and there was this one scene where Kevin Spacey who's the main character in the movie he plays the main character he is looking at a computer screen at his job and you could see like lines of text they almost look like jail cell bars they look like bars so he's like imprisoned in his mundane ordinary life and he's trying to break out of that and he does start to rebel against his ordinary life and rebel against what his wife wants yada yada the, the typical American family he's just trying to break out of that so anyway my group and I we were like analyzing breaking all that down and making all kinds of like oh that that's something that's something I don't know it was a lot of fun it was the greatest class ever but it was really hard uh, people were complaining about how harsh the teacher graded but I still got an A somehow thank goodness I would have been sad if I got not an A because it would have been my only B in college if I would have gotten not an A but uh, I thought I was I almost gave the teacher a bad review on a uh, rate my professor.com which is what I would use to find my professors but anyway it was the best you know class I took in college when I was still a film major but it really just counted as an English class and what a great English class where you could talk about film all day but yeah we read we read stuff too like that's where I read Fight Club I read um what else did we read and we watched Fight Club, of course, as well. So American Beauty, I can't remember. So not everything had a book paired up with it. Obviously, American Beauty did not. Just some of the things had books paired with it. I think we read... I can't remember. But we watched a lot of great stuff. I know we watched Big Fish. Um, just so much good stuff. So yeah, I wanted to go into film school, like, but I just didn't want to make film. I would have loved to have done a, a film criticism type of thing, but they didn't offer that there. So I switched to, like... Basically, an equivalent of general studies. But my whole life, I've loved film. I've always wanted to do something with it because I would watch movies over and over again. There's certain movies that I would be obsessed with and rewatch over and over again. And I'm also a big Halloween fan. Like, I love Halloween in general. So, once I started to like Halloween as a kid, you know, I kind of liked horror. But my love of horror, like, increased in college as well because my dad, I convinced him to start to have a Halloween party and start to decorate for Halloween again. And so around that time, and even before the party, I would like watch horror movies around Halloween, which a lot of people do, but I would, it would feel so special because the time of the year already feels special. So it would just feel very thematic. And it's like, oh, it's such a great feeling, like watching the horror movies and it's fall time outside and listening to the spooky music. And it was just a whole big vibe. So I got into horror hardcore, but then, you know, I've been even getting into it the last few years even more because instead of rewatching the same movies every year, which I kind of tend to do sometimes, I've been branching out to more horror than I ever did before. 
So now I'm going to show you, I'm doing this awesome marathon with my friend Kat. We watch a lot of movies and do a lot of marathons and then we have these chats on Zoom and I upload them to my YouTube channel. So we decided to do a whole summer slasher marathon where each movie, the only criteria, it has to be a slasher essentially. So let's take a look at the movies. It's, I believe it's 15 movies. You see them now on your screen. And I'm pretty excited about these. So we've got Intruder, that takes place in a grocery store. Sleepaway Camp, which somehow I have never seen. This is Dario Argento's Deep Red, which has my favorite horror score of all time. Um, the movie's also known as Profondo Rosso, and that's what the theme is called. It's like my favorite horror score theme ever. It's wonderful. We've got Alice Sweet Alice. We've got Someone's Watching Me. Visiting Hours, Alone in the Dark, which was super hard to get. Kat had to get the DVD from Netflix, and we're going to have to either watch it together or she's going to have to watch it and let me borrow the DVD because to buy it is super, super expensive. Then we've got Psycho 2. Then we've got a very zany kind of movie called Aquarius. I think it's also called... Is that Stage Fright? I can't see the screen very big, but um, that one takes place like... I think there's these theater people putting on a show, and it's really zany, I heard. I can't wait to watch that one. Also, Popcorn is on the list here. When a Stranger Calls Back, which I heard was a lot of fun. Halloween, like this Halloween, not the original, obviously. This is one of the later Halloweens. Uh, I'm not that excited about that particular one that I have here, but I figured, okay, you can't have a slasher marathon without, like, one of the, you know the classic slasher movies like Halloween. So this is a movie from the Halloween franchise that I don't really remember too well. I might have seen it one time. So I put that on the list. I can't remember. And then we've got the Behind the Mask. I can't wait to watch that one. Heard good things. Uh, then we've got Hush, which I actually already watched recently. Like, I kicked off the marathon early. Cat, if you see this at one point, I'm sorry. I started early. I wanted to get a jump start on things. And then we've got Bloody Birthday, which I heard about, like, evil kids. Plus, I love that, like, movie poster right there for Bloody Birthday. It uh, looks really cool. So I'm excited about this. Very excited. So yeah, woo! That's the Summer Slasher Marathon. Super jazz. Also, I'm going to try to read some slasher horror books as well. It'll probably be, like, you know, newer horror. We'll see. Uh, I haven't had, I don't have it all picked out yet. Pardon me for drinking on camera. It's hard with these long streams. You need to get, you need to rehydrate, you know? Alright, so Horror Gardener says, Angela's theme from Sleepaway Camp is one of the best songs. I can't wait to hear it. I'm excited, Horror Gardener. Woo! And yes, okay, so Horror Gardener also mentions the band Goblin, which, oh my gosh, totally uh, does awesome music. And I love Suspiria. That's my favorite Dario Argento movie. And Goblin, of course, does the soundtrack for that. And their theme for Suspiria just blows me away. I listen to it every October. Now, you know, like, most horror fans, they don't... They don't limit themselves to watching horror during Hall just during October and Halloween time. For a lot of years, though, I did. Because it made Halloween more special for me. So I would save all the horror I wanted to watch for just the month of October. Sometimes, like, I would start... Last year, I started on the first day of fall, which was, like, September 22nd. Because that counts, by the way. It does count. It's it's Halloween time, technically, in my mind. It's fall. So, uh, most years, though, I would just wait till October. Most horror fans do not do that. They just watch horror all year round. Well, now, I've been doing that now. But I, I never did that before. I would always just leave it so it would be extra special. Because, like, the anticipation when October came near. I mean, it's always great. But it was even greater when, like, I hadn't watched horror movies in, like, months. And I had been, like, waiting and waiting and waiting. So, yeah, I only also listen to horror music. I have a whole playlist. And I usually start whenever I decide to, like, start, like, my celebration, which would either be October 1st or the first day of fall, that's when I start listening to it. And I'm like, yeah, it's time. And I really get pumped up. So, yeah, Goblins, uh, Suspiria, and also Profondo Rosso, their song Profondo Rosso, uh, those two are a staple in my little Halloween music playlist. I call it a Halloween playlist because I basically limit it, like I said, to October. And it's a lot of fun, though. It makes it more special. So, although I've expanded my horror movie watching to all year long, and my horror reading, obviously, to all year long, I'm limiting the music, and that's not going to change. The music really, there's something about having the windows down 
or the windows open in your house if you're not in your car uh and just listening to like spooky themes or also like when I was exercising um and running during last October it went by so fast when I was listening to my Halloween playlist with all these horror scores and horror songs it just made it better I don't know I hate running but I do it so like my best 5k actually was last October in the park I ran four miles which I like have not matched since running that amount of that amount of distance but it was because I attributed it to the Halloween playlist I was like yeah yeah Suspiria came on while I was running so the thing has a great you know John Carpenter has some great uh scores because he does his own music for his movies uh, man like the thing obviously Halloween just he's got so much good music that I really enjoy the fog has great music as well the movie the fog so yeah lots of good stuff and Dave agrees the music in Suspiria is so good. Yes, it perfectly like matches the movie. So I'm very excited about Deep Red because I actually have never seen it somehow, some way, even though I am a big Dario Argento fan. And I actually own a lot of his special edition Blu-rays that were released and I have them all like in a row. Now I will say, so I tried to watch opera like two years ago and I freaked out. I nearly passed out and I never am like this. Well, I mean, I sometimes am like it where I get a little creeped out and I, I get a little like almost nauseated at certain things. Usually things don't affect me, but eye stuff really gets to me and there's a part where I've talked about this on a previous video a long time ago. They tape like needles Oh, they tape like a row of needles like underneath her eye to where she would blink and I blink a lot like so like ugh, if she blinks like her eye would like her eye lid would get ripped up I had to turn it off and I never finished it I've got to finish it like I've got to get past that scene I was really enjoying it is the funny part uh but yeah that part really messed me up I gotta say I almost barfed uh, I literally like felt a little nauseated. I was like the eye thing. It just like got to me so, like just because thinking of my eyes and stuff. So yeah, I could read about that in a book, but like seeing it like with her eyes like that, I was like, oh, like get it away, get it away. I just couldn't take it. Uh, Nails is singing Rob Hates Needles. Yeah, like that really was too much for me. Like the needles by the eyes. Ugh. I am very excited, Horror Gardener, about Deep Red. And like I said, I already have heard the score, well, it was parts of the score. The main theme, Profondo Rosso, is like one of my favorite themes ever. So somehow I found that theme like on a list of like best, best uh, horror scores. I think I looked it up on YouTube and that's how I found Profondo Rosso, the, the theme. It was wonderful when I found it. I was like, this is my favorite. Like the org, like there's an organ in it. It's just, it's just perfect. But it's like really kind of a, upbeat at the same time so basically if you guys were here for the intro my song which was done by the amazing uh guy on youtube the intellectual dark wave you could check out his channel he does custom commissioned work and he provided that music for me i asked him to base it off of profondo rosso like something like kind of like you know makes you like you know want to do this but also is creepy so he did a great job i really loved like what he came up with for me so like yes I was very excited. Yay! Uh, Dave says body horror is so rough. Yeah, sometimes it really is rough. Like, anything to do with, like, razors, as in, like, you know, shaving razors. I talked about this with my book club the other day when I was in Florida. I had a book club meeting. I didn't want to reschedule it, so we talked about... We, we read Video Night, and there's a scene where somebody, like, is cutting up their skin with, like, a Bic razor blade. They take the blade out of the razor, but I just was telling my book club, like, that's one of the things that gets to me, that and eyes. It's like the big razors because a co-worker told me a story about her and her sister throwing away their razors without a cover on them, and their dad cut their hand to a bloody pulp, and they felt so bad that they had discarded their ra razors, like, you know without any care and uh ever since then I get so paranoid about my razors I'm like oh my god put the cover on them I get like paranoid about like grabbing the razor like what if I like accidentally like brush it against my hand like I don't know it freaks me out ever since hearing that story from my coworker. it's something that freaks me the f out Okay, so let's take a look. This is the last thing and then we'll be wrapping up. Thanks so much guys for sticking with me. I know it's been a long chat. These things go an hour. These live chats easily go an hour. So I'm so sorry. That's just me. I'm long winded. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm sorry. I love I love you guys for sticking with me. So here's my shark marathon that I'm going to be doing with my amazing friend who I love very much, Nathaniel Toll, who is the author. I say this each and every time and I will say it each and every time because it's one of the best books to have around for Halloween time. He's the author of Pumpkin Cinema. I will show it to you. I have it here. 
I have my physical copy. I have bookmarked so many pages because I get a lot of my movie watching recommendations from this book. And yes, there's a lot of movies that people have probably heard of already in here. But what is great is it's got a lot of TV show suggestions and a lot of kids movie suggestions that you could watch as an adult will give you the nostalgia feels so yeah pumpkin cinema the best movies for halloween so it's not the best horror movies it's specifically the best movies to watch around halloween meaning a movie like the thing or the shining won't be suggested because it's got a snow feel it's got a winter feel it's gonna have autumn feels it's gonna have halloweeny vibes something about the movie will fit Nathan's criteria to be in this book so and we'll have a Halloweeny feel to it so yeah Nathan and I are doing this shark marathon together and we're gonna have a chat on my YouTube so stay tuned for that but if you haven't heard of this book I highly recommend it I literally give it my highest recommendation uh, I just think it's wonderful it's very uh underrated book there's not a lot of reviews on Goodreads if you do pick it up and read it please review it on Goodreads and spread the word please because I love it and my friend Nathan is, like, a great guy, so that's another reason to buy the book. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, he called me Special K the other day. I was like, oh my god, that's the coolest nickname. I've got to respond back, but uh, no one's ever, like, given me, like, these cool nicknames. He's given me a couple so far, and it's, like, my favorite part of our messages. Like, oh, Special K, like, the cereal, but I'm Kelsey, Special K. I don't know. Anyway, it's cool. <laughs> I loved it. So we're going to read... Along with watching shark movies, we're going to read Jaws 2, and we're also going to read Goosebumps Deep Trouble. Actually, Nathan's already read Deep Trouble, so he's already got a jump on me on this marathon right now. So, that's okay. Uh, I will catch up, because I'm going to be doing this throughout July, and also, I think, a little bit into August as well. We haven't really determined when, uh, when our end date for the marathon is, but we'll, we'll have to see. Thanks, Horror Gardener, for stopping by. Uh, Mystic Mac, yes, I am on Goodreads. If you go to any other video on my YouTube channel, any video that wasn't a live video, you'll see that I have, like, a, a whole bunch of links down below in Goodreads. My Goodreads link is in my, uh, other YouTube video descriptions. So, yeah, I love reading other people's reviews on Goodreads. It's a lot of fun. All right, we also have Zam Uncut in the chat. Thanks for joining. Any 90s YA horror finds lately? Super into reading them, especially Christopher Pike. Actually, you missed it because you must have joined late. I did show one Christopher Pike book I bought. Eternal... Where are you? Where are you? Eternal Enemy. And it's a first printing. So I'm excited. I already had, you know, another copy of this, but it wasn't a first printing. So in Florida, I found a first printing and I was like, yes! So I bought it. Yes, I, I really want to get to Christopher Pike. I actually have a lot of Christopher Pike that I've been buying, so excited to find a few more. But I actually have a few more vintage, you know, horror YA titles, but I'll be doing a whole nother book haul on that soon because I just got a whole bunch of Fear Street in because I want to start reading that. Again, influenced by Cameron Chaney. He's, like, my biggest influence. Uh, and I say that, like, I think his channel is so inspirational. I think everyone... I'm sure everyone already knows of him, but if you don't, you've got to check him out. But I'm sure you already have, because uh, he's awesome. And yes, I I want to read Fear Street and see what that's all about, so I'm excited. But back to the sharks, which I love Jaws, by the way. So I don't have Jaws on this list, the original Jaws, but I think I might sneak it into the marathon. Even though I've seen it a billion zillion times, and actually, I don't know if around you guys' hometowns or cities, they did this, but there was a tour of... I guess, orchestras getting, like, copies of Jaws, and they did this with Star Wars, they did this with Harry Potter. Basically, you go, and you see the orchestra play, but they play along with the movie, and it's awesome. So, I saw Jaws, I saw Star Wars, like I said, and also Harry Potter, the three I mentioned, and I, I think I saw Jurassic Park. There, there was a whole bunch they did this with, but the Jaws one was awesome. So, you go there, and you basically go to wherever the orchestra plays, and then you see the movie, and they play along live. So the, the basically, I guess the movie is a copy of the movie that doesn't have the music included, I'm guessing. I, I don't know. I guess it's a special version without the actual soundtrack. So it's so cool to watch them do it live and to hear it live. And it's a lot more bombastic because, you know, it's right there with you. So yeah, that's the last time I watched Jaws, which was about two years ago when I saw it at the orchestra while they played along. But yeah, I might sneak it in, uh, even though I've seen it a, a ton. 
But here's the list of the shark movies I'll be watching. Bait, which I believe is a ridiculous story, by the way. I believe, let me pull up the Letterboxd. I'm also on Letterboxd, guys. If you like Goodreads, I don't do a lot of movie reviews. I, I definitely have been reviewing every book I've read, but I wish I actually reviewed movies on Letterboxd, but I basically just use it to keep track of my marathons. So if you add me on Letterboxd, the, really the only good thing is seeing what marathons I have planned. Like, I already have my Halloween marathon, which is about 50 movies planned, and that's on my Letterboxd. Alright, so Bait is a freak tsunami traps shoppers at a coastal Australian supermarket inside the building, along with a 12-foot great white shark. That's pretty absurd, uh, but also freaking fantastic. Now, Nathan told me that he tried to watch this, and he just wasn't feeling it, so he turned it off a few years ago, but he said, let's give it another go, and so he decided, uh, and he agreed to let us add it to the marathon, so I was happy that he was willing to give it another go. So, I don't know what that means. Like, is it really bad? So, we'll see. I will have to report back to you guys. Stay tuned for me and Nathan's chat to see my thoughts on bait, which sounds so absurd. My dad is the one who told me about it, and my dad literally, he was like, you have got to add it. It's so bad, but it's also entertaining and so out there. So, my dad was praising it pretty highly, so that's why I added it and asked Nathan, let's do this. Come on. So, Nathan wanted to add Open Water 3 Cage Dive. And it says, first you find the sharks, then they find you. Three friends from California are filming an audition tape for an extreme reality game show. They document their journey to Australia where they will be doing their most dangerous dangerous activity, shark cage diving. A catastrophic turn of events, though, leaves them in baited water full of great white sharks, turning their recording into a bloody, blood-chilling diary of survival and death. That one sounds awesome. All right, then we've got two films from the Jaws franchise. We've got Jaws 2, which I already have seen, and Jaws the Revenge, which I also believe I have seen. But I haven't seen either in many years. And we, we added Jaws 2 because we're going to read the book, as I said. So we want to do a big whole compare and contrast. I'm really happy Nathan agreed to add it because I saw on his letterbox, he just watched this like three years ago. So it's probably not, you know that far removed in his memory to where he probably didn't need to rewatch it, but I'm so glad he said, yeah, let's add it. So yay, because I don't remember much of it at all. I remember bits and pieces, but not the majority of it, and definitely not enough to compare it to the book, and I do want to fairly compare it to the book and be able to tell the differences in our chat. Like, oh, this was different, that was different. I want to have it all very fresh. So then Jaws the Revenge is the next one, and I believe, is that like the fourth or fifth one, I can't remember. I've seen like them all up to a certain point. So this plot for Jaws the Revenge is, after another deadly shark attack, Ellen Brody decides she has had enough of New England's Amity Island and moves to the Caribbean to join her son, Michael, and his family. But a great white shark has followed her there, hungry for more lives. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so, so now we got sharks following people f out for, like, revenge and blood. That is absurd, but also marvelous. I am very much looking forward to it. Then we've got another kind of cheesy title that I'm going to check out. It's called The Last Shark, and this was directed by Enzo G. Castorelli, and this was released in 1981 and actually was pulled because it rips off so much from Jaws. It was almost like an imitation of the movie Jaws. Even, like, this awesome actor in it who's usually known for, like, doing good roles, he basically was ripping off, like, Robert Shaw's performance as Quint, which is insane. Like, why, why not go a different route? Why were they trying to just replicate it? Obviously trying to play off the success and popularity. But, uh, yeah, The Last Shark, pretty crazy. Uh, when you're a 35-foot great white shark, I'm sorry, when a, I read, I read that wrong, tongue twister, when a 35-foot great white shark begins to wreak havoc on a seaside town, the mayor, not wanting to endanger his gubernatorial campaign, declines to act. So a local shark hunter and a horror author, 
Oh, that sounds interesting, though. Band together to stop the beast. So instead of just, like, you know, Chief Brody, it's a horror author. Like, instead of, like, a shark hunter, which, of course, is played by Richard Dreyfus, it's this random horror author. And, of course, uh, also, there's no... Uh, the Quint is the shark hunter in this iteration. Quint is the shark hunter in Jaws, and in this one, they don't even name him here. We'll have to see if uh, he even tries to do the accent and everything that Robert Shaw does. We'll have to see. I I'm very excited to compare that to Jaws. And then finally, a new movie coming out this very year. In fact, like, I think it's either going to be, like, later this, uh, in July. So very, very soon. It is called Great White. And the poster looks amazing. And the description says, Take your final breath. A tourist trip quickly turns into a living nightmare when five passengers on a seaplane become stranded miles away from shore. What follows is a desperate bid for survival as the group tries to make it to land before they either run out of supplies or are taken by the man-eating sharks lurking just beneath the surface. It really does look good. Um, that's one that Nathan suggested, and it was his idea to do this shark marathon. He's like, there's a new movie coming out, we should do a whole thing. And I'm like, heck yeah, let's do it. So I'm pretty pumped about it. I can't wait. It'll be a lot of fun. If anyone else in the horror tube com community ever wants to do marathon, you know, horror marathons together, I know I'm really kind of more into the book tube community right now, but anyone who wants to also watch horror movies, I love doing these marathons. They're a lot of fun. I do them all year long now. I just started them doing all year long starting last year. But yeah, if you ever want to do one with a cool theme, let me know because I'm always up for that. And then we could have like a chat together, like on Zoom and upload it. Or we could even do a live chat and, and do that live on YouTube. So yeah, I'm always looking for new little opportunities and little friends to do marathons with. Woo! But yeah, those are my two marathons for the summer. Super pumped. It should be a lot of fun. should be kind of hot and summery feeling as I'm watching these movies. Now, the summer slasher films don't take place in summer all, necessarily. They're just, you know, basically summer and slasher, the words go together. So that's why that I'm combining those two things. But it's just a good time. You know, we're getting closer and closer to Halloween. It's a good time to kind of get some more horror movies in there and do a very specific marathon. I like slasher movies quite a bit, so I'm super pumped because actually, you know, the amount I've watched is actually very slim. I should really be up to speed more on some slasher movies and I've picked some good ones. Now, I almost picked a movie I did see in film school, as I said earlier, film school called uh, Peeping Tom. We watched clips of Peeping Tom and then we were told to watch the whole movie and I did watch it back in the day, back when I had a Netflix DVD subscription where you would get the DVDs mailed to you. My, my friend Kat still has that, but back in the day, I used to just get the DVDs too because they didn't have streaming yet. So I remember it was back when they did that, and that's how I watched Peeping Tom. And it was really good, and I almost put it on my Summer Slasher Marathon list for this year, and it would have been a rewatch. But I was like, nah, I've already seen it. Let me make room for more movies I haven't seen. So sometimes I really have got to force myself to not do these rewatches. Because then I never wind up watching new movies. And that's how it snowballs into year after year I'm watching the same old movies. Because they're comforting, they're nostalgic, they're my favorite horror jams, you know? But I try to get out of that, and I have been. I, like, last year, I watched 65 horror movies starting on September 22nd, the first day of fall, and ending on October 31st. And it was a ball. It was amazing. It was the best time ever. I don't even know how I accomplished 65 movies. I had originally only planned for 50, but actually... So, Nathaniel Toll's book, um, Pumpkin Cinema, really only covers up to a certain amount of time where he can suggest movies, because obviously it was published a few years ago. But he personally gave me some suggestions last year, and everyone that I got from him every movie suggestion I liked and I was all like yeah I got new suggestions it was like a new pumpkin cinema that I only got access to personally and I was like yeah so it was a lot of fun anyway I can't wait to do more marathons and I'll be updating you guys as it goes I'll also be doing more book hauls so again guys if you aren't subscribed please consider subscribing it would really truly mean a lot and if you could comment if you're watching this after I'm done my live stream that would also help too it would help the crazy YouTube algorithm and stuff like that the algorithm is so insane. So, damn you algorithm, let's stick it to the algorithm. Like, you know how they say, stick it to the man. Let's stick it to that YouTube algorithm and, like, try to make the videos, like, do a little bit better and, like, you know, have a further reach. I would really appreciate it so much. But what I already do appreciate is you guys spend the time with me, as I've referenced a few times in the video. I'm really not exaggerating when I say 
thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And today, you made me so much happier. I was so bummed out in such a down mood. It's been a hard weekend for me, so thank you so much. I'm really feeling a lot better since I just got to show you all my little, like, horror books. It's always such a joy. All right, so I can't wait for you guys to see what else I bought from Florida because I saved kind of, like, the best stuff for, like, the next haul. So I'm sorry to you guys today. Not that we didn't look at cool stuff, but, like, there's way better stuff on the horizon. And I'm really jazzed for you guys to see it. So I can't wait. All right, guys, that's it for me this time, though. Love you all so much. Appreciate you. And if you could spread the word to other people who love horror books and horror movies and also nostalgia. Because one last thing I'll plug is that I have actually found a video I did a long time ago, movie taglines, 90 kids movies taglines, like the tagline for Jumanji, the tagline, whatever. I did a whole video about old school taglines for 90s movies, and I never uploaded it to YouTube. I just did it on Twitch. So I found that. I'm going to edit it. I'm going to upload it. So that's more 90s content coming to you, you know, in the next few months. So woo! Can't wait. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate you. Till next time, keep on killing it. Bye. If I could ever find my goodbye graphic, which I never have ready for some reason. All right, now bye for real. See you guys. Thank you again.